The following podcast is brought to you by the Bridge Bible Church. For more information, information, please visit us online at at thebridgewire.com. We are continuing our series on Colossians, and uh, the the series is entitled Dear Church, and that's just taken uh, out of the... The, the thought of that Paul was just writing to the church this letter, a very personal letter to them, just helping them uh, live life to the fullest in Jesus Christ. And, and it's also a letter to us, penned by Paul to the church of Colossae, but it's also penned in the power of the Holy Spirit, and it's a, ch- a letter to us. So dear church is for us too, dear church here at the bridge. And so today we're looking at what is uh, this message today is genuine faith. And so let me ask you, have you ever been unsettled? Like just unsettled in your faith. Like maybe I'm just I'm not quite doing this right. Like I haven't, did I, have I done all that I'm supposed to be doing? Am I following correctly? Is, is this how it's supposed to look? Am I, am I really doing the things that God would have me to do? Am I really walking in the fullness? And have you ever been unsettled after maybe having a conversation with somebody? And they start talking about spiritual things. And you left that small group or you left that Bible study or you left a, a Sunday morning and you just, you just thought, am I, am I really where I'm supposed to be? Well, this morning what we're going to see is that Paul wants the church to be settled, to not have anxiety and, and, and be unsettled and, and to have this sense of not knowing what God wants for them. He wants them to be settled in Christ. And so what we're going to see today is from chapter 1 to chapter 2, there's a shift. And he's going to talk to us today about how we can have full assurance in Christ as we continue after him. So let me pray. And we're going to read a long section. I'm going to bust through it. I'm not going to do everything verse by verse. We're going to unpack this whole chapter uh, today. and, uh, And we'll get through it. But we're going to see this message of being settled in Christ. So let me pray, and then we'll start reading in chapter 2. So Father, we just thank you. We thank you for, for Christ Jesus, who is our hope. And so as we read further right now in the scriptures, Holy Spirit, just pray that you would open our eyes to see how we are joined to Christ and in him, and how we can have peace and be settled, and that we don't have to worry about all the different things that we may strive after to be at peace with you. Those things we can lay down, that we can have peace in Christ. And so teach us in that. Help us to see that clearly so that we can walk with Christ in obedience and have joy and not anxiety and frustration along the way. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so Colossians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. I'll be reading through uh, verse 19. So it starts like this. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments, For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy or empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh God made alive together with him having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. 
This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going, in, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. This is the word of God. So what we see here in Colossians chapter 2 is that Paul is wanting to have the church see that they, they have outside influences pushing in. And it can cause them to be unsettled. And so he starts in chapter 1 with this real positive feeling. So if you remember last week, we talked about our identity in Christ and who Christ is and what Christ has done. And that as a fellowship, as an assembly, they had love for one another that was really, really good and rooted there in faith. And he was this thankful for their faith. And, and so we saw this real positive uh, foundation that he was laying in chapter 1. In the end of chapter 1, verse 28, he says this. He says, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. And so he stops at the end of that chapter with, with the statement of, in light of who Christ is and what he has done, we just preach him. We preach him to everybody. And we just share this great news of Jesus with everybody. And so you would expect like this, this good feeling to carry on in his next few paragraphs. But then all of a sudden he turns this corner and he starts talking about the circumstance that they're in. And that there's this sense that there's people pulling on them and, and people wooing them away, trying to get them to leave Christ and to gain other spiritual things or add other spiritual things. And so it unsettles the soul. So what we want to do is see that what Paul starts with is this foundation of living in Christ. It's much like the illustration of, of uh, those who work on spotting counterfeits for the government. And what they do is they train these employees who, who will look at money that comes across their path. They will know the original so well. They'll know the type of paper, the ink, the feel, the smell. They'll know what happens when certain chemicals are applied. They'll know what it looks like under certain lighting. They'll, I mean, they will know those bills so well that they don't study the counterfeits. Because the counterfeits always change and try to catch up and just have very nuances and, and, and to look like the original, but they're, they're not. And so they know the original so well that they spot the counterfeit. And that's what Paul is doing there. He says, here's our foundation. Here's Christ. Here's who he is. Let's really look at him. Let's center in on who Jesus is. And then anything that comes in that's not that, that's not Christ, we're going to recognize it. Anything that, that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, against the truth of God, we can take it down and say, no, we're not following that. That's not truth. That's not right. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So if we focus on him, if we know him so well, we know the truth. We know the way. We know the life. And anything that comes in, we are able to discern it and set it aside, and we don't have to have trouble in our soul. But so often, we get distracted. And that's what chapter 2 is talking about here, how, how people are being distracted at the Church of Colossae with these outside influences and they're being troubled. They're being unsettled. And he wants the assembly, he wants the church to be founded in Christ and be settled and to have full assurance. That's what he wants for us, to have full assurance that we don't have to worry about what's happening around us. So let's look here at just a few things that, that just really bring this idea out that, that the world is, is pushing in. Verse 4 he says here, he says, verse 4, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. Now, this word deluded means believing something that is not true. So he's saying, you may hear some things that sound really good. These plausible arguments. And they will unsettle your soul if you go after them. 
And so many times, uh, often, you know, I think back to when I was younger in my faith, there was this arguments that would come in. I would hear other people, I talk about how I love Jesus, how I gave my life to Jesus, and everything's changing. You know, I remember this as a, as a young man in college, and it's like, I heard the gospel, and I said, yes, I want that. And Jesus just starts, you know, changing my life, and I'm sharing that with someone else, and they're like, Rob, well, that sounds really good, but have you thought about this? And then they start dropping some knowledge on me, you know, and the argument sounds so good, and I'm like, well, is it more, is it Jesus and this? Like, do I have to have this as well? Like, is, is, was that not enough? And I start worrying, it's like, oh, maybe I didn't, maybe I didn't do enough. Maybe my, maybe I didn't pray like the right prayer or something. Like, did I do the right things? And I start thinking about this. And I talk with somebody else and they say, well, that's good, Rob. But, you know, it really, until you start having this experience in your life, you're really not following God until you've really experienced this. And this is happening in your life. And you start seeing God in these ways. Maybe uh, as we read here in the, in the passage, through the visions or maybe through gifts or something of the Spirit. And he's like, unless you've experienced these things, Rob, you really aren't following God. And then I felt unsettled. Like, am I missing it over here? I'm like, is that really what is going on? And I, I was trying to get settled in my soul, but I, yet I, these arguments sounded good. I was talking with people, and they, like, they had foundation, it seemed like. They had some backup. They had some things they were sharing. And, and, but what it was doing was pulling me away. And he says, so don't be deluded by believing something that's not true. In those situations, that I, those illustrations that I shared with you, in those situations, it had to do with my salvation. It wasn't that I was full or complete in Christ unless I had these things. And those, those things were unsettling to me. So Paul says, Rob, you don't have to be deluded. You don't have to believe those truths. That's not where salvation lies. It lies in Christ. So verse 8, he goes on. He says that he doesn't want us to be taken captive. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. And so here, this idea of philosophy, Paul's not talking that we're not allowed to read philosophy or Plato or any of that stuff. Like he's, That's not what he's talking about. What he means when he's talking about philosophy in this situation is those schemes of life. Like, how do you answer the ideas and questions of life? And so, yes, philosophers do try to do that. But, you know, our world today tries to do that in many ways. There are people out there that say, this is what life looks like, and how do I answer the questions like, who is God, and who is man, and how do I relate to God, and what does that mean for me, and, and what's the purpose of life? Is there meaning in life for, for any of us? And we, they, they try to answer those questions, and those are philosophies. Those are schemes in which we live our life. And, and so Paul is saying here, don't be taken captive. Don't let those things imprison you that you're trying to live life under a new scheme, a new philosophy of living. Don't let them capture you and pull you away from Jesus. It's going to unsettle your soul because in Jesus, all of these things are answered. So philosophy is these ideas and how we relate to God and how we're supposed to live. And anything contrary to Christ can bring us anxiety and worry and, and unsettle us. Verse 16, he says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you. This is and we'll talk more about it, but this is getting to a context of like a religious state where here in this passage, they're saying what, what you're doing or what you're not doing makes you acceptable or pleasing to God. Whether you are doing certain in this sense, it says here, let no one pass judgment on you in food or drink or regard to festival or new moon. So it, it, this is a Jewish argument that's coming out here in Colossae, but it, for us, it's like, saying, don't let someone pass judgment on you by, by what you eat or drink or, or what you do, what holidays you observe or not observe. We just came out for Christmas, and, and, and I think that there's probably a sense that a lot of people who kind of feel like, I got to get right with God, you know, Christmas and Easter, that, that's the two big times. It's like, oh yeah, I probably should be in church. I probably should do those things. And, and so what do we do? We start hitting all the religious festivals, right? The Christian festival, Christmas and Easter, right? And so everybody shows up and they start doing those things. And they, they go to the services, they go to the mass or whatever. They do the prayer times. They do the, 
the times with family and all this, and they feel really good about themselves because they've done culturally the religious, what is expected to be made right with God. It's like, yeah, I did all of those things, so Jesus must be happy with me right now. Like, I feel pretty good moving into the new year to ask him to give me some good stuff this year because, you know, I really nailed December, or at least for a week, you know, so God's got to be happy, and we're moving it, and People are like, what did you do? And you, you, I told you all the stuff I did. And they're like, okay, yeah, that's good. That's good stuff. You know, and, and that's not what makes us right with God. That's not what makes us acceptable and pleasing. And here, Paul would say, don't let someone pass judgment on you whether you did those things or you didn't do those things. Because some will look at it and say, if you did these things, you're doing great. But, oh, you didn't do those things. You didn't do those things. In this situation, it was a, a Jewish argument. And they would say, oh, we're glad you love Jesus, but what are you eating? What are you drinking? Are you doing all the holidays? Did you observe all of those? Because that's what makes you holy. That's what makes you right. That's what makes you acceptable. That's what makes you pleasing. Are you doing these things? We would call it legalism today, right? In, the, in, our, in our context, it's like, you know, maybe how you dress or what, whether or not you have the certain translation of the Bible or whatever. I mean, there's all kinds of arguments of different things that you have to do to be right. Don't let someone pass, Paul says, don't let someone pass judgment on you. Don't let someone pass judgment on you. It, you know, Coming out of the South, I don't know if any of you guys spent any time in the South, but coming out of the South, there's a lot of churches where we were at one time that were King James-only churches. You know, it was good enough for Paul and Peter. It's good enough for me because they used the King James. They did not use the King James. But that was kind of the argument. Like, if you didn't use the King James Bible, you weren't using the Bible. And God's not happy with that worship. Like, how could God anoint that preaching? He doesn't even preach from the King James. Now, I'm making this argument to say that there's this judgment that can get passed on legal, there's this sense of legalism, like what's right and wrong. Is that focused on Christ? No, it's not focused on Christ at all. It's focused on what you're doing or not doing. And so Paul says, that's unsettling when someone comes to you and you let them pass judgment on you. He says, don't let that happen. We are to not let them pass judgment on you. And then finally in verse 16 or 18, he says, let no one disqualify you. Let no one disqualify you. I mean, isn't that really, when we get to the, the end of it all, isn't that what we're looking for? Like, we want to be right with God. We want to have done the right things. We, we want to know that we have a relationship with God that's been reconciled, that, that God is pleased with us and that we have relationship with him and that we're walking in, in a way that brings us with God in the fullness of Christ and that, that we know we're doing what he expects us to do. And, and we have joy and we have peace and we're settled and, and we don't have to worry about God being angry or bringing judgment or, or trying to discern whether or not something in our life happened because of fill in the blank. I mean, aren't we trying to, to just find the sense of wholeness with him? And Paul says, don't let someone disqualify you. Because you don't have certain experiences. That's where this argument starts to go in, in, the, in the text. He says, in this sense, they're going to start saying whether you've done this or you haven't done this or you've had these experiences. That's what qualifies you before God. And Paul says, no, it's, it's Christ that qualifies us. It's, it's Christ who gives us wholeness. It's Christ that we're in. So don't let someone disqualify you by saying, oh, you're really not following Jesus because you haven't had this experience like I have. So don't let someone disqualify you. All of these things unsettle our spirit. They unsettle our soul. And so Paul wants us to know that we are to be settled, that we have an assurance that comes from God. And so there's three things that come out of the very end of chapter one and, and chapter two. And so I'm really preaching the broadness of this today. I'm not preaching all the verse by verse as you've already gathered, but um, this broad sense, he wants us to see that we can have a, 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 a life in Christ that is settled, that has peace, that is assured, and we don't have to be unsettled. So Paul does this in three ways. Well, first he starts with the foundation. So chapter 1, uh, verses 15 through 20, what we see here is who Christ is. And I'm not re-preaching this. It just says that he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And it talks about who he is over all creation. And everything is his, and it was for him. And that he is the head of the, the assembly, the church here. And that 
he is the one who has brought us to reconciliation. It says in verse 20, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So what we see in verses 15 through 20 is who he is and what he does. That's the foundation. Who Christ is and what Christ has done. Like, you got to know what you're shooting at, right? That's the center of the bullseye. Like, who Christ is and what Christ has done. Focus here. So he, he lays that foundation and he says, focus here. Church, you're loving one another and you have faith and it's in this Jesus and it's in what this Jesus has done. The, the Jesus who has saved us, who has the image of the invisible God who has come down and, and brought all things together and reconciled all things together through his blood, made peace at the cross for us. And so he says what? So then he says, in light of that, we proclaim him. Again, verse 28. So, so he says, here's the foundation. You focus on who Christ is and what Christ has done. And then we share that with one another. We just talk about who this Jesus is and how he brings new life to us. That's the center of it right? And so then we get into chapter 2, and we carry this in a little bit further, this argument. And so verses 2 and 3, he says this. He says, that their hearts may be encouraged. He's talking to those who haven't seen him. He's saying that your hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance and understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so he wants us to see that in Christ is all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, and in Christ is full assurance, and we can understand what life is really about. So what he's saying is anything that matters in life, when we talk about philosophies, anything that answers those questions, any other thing that matters in life is found in Christ, in Christ alone. The fullness of all of those questions. Who is God? Who is man? How do we relate to God? How do we relate to each other? How do I find salvation? Is there life after death? What is the purpose? What is my meaning? Like all of these questions are answered in Jesus. And he says, so this is where we focus and this is where we are to be. So Paul wants the church, he wants us, the bridge, to have Jesus first in our thinking. So when we think about life, when we think about what we're doing and why we're doing it and what we're going about, is Jesus first in your thinking? He said, well, that's where you should be centered. Like, who is Christ? What has he done? What does he have for us being in him? What would he have me do here? Like, Jesus should be first in our thinking. And so Paul wants them to center on that foundation. So if you're thinking about life and, and living and how to do this, and Jesus is not the center of it, then what happens? Well, we start to have some anxiety and trouble. It's like, am I really doing this right? Is that really God's will for me? Am I really doing the right steps? Is this really what I'm supposed to be doing? We get unsettled when Christ isn't at the center. And so Paul says, no, make him the center. Make sure that this is your foundation. This is where you're focused. Jesus first in the middle. So now we have to ask the question, well, what troubles us? So we went through that list and just quickly kind of walking through that again. What troubles us? Well, what we see is that somebody or someone here in, in Colossae is, is just really messing with the church. They're harassing the church through different philosophies and traditions and different teachings. There's, so you have a, a Jewish and Gentile culture and that are coming to faith in Jesus and they're blending themselves together as the assembly, the church, right? So you have people from different backgrounds coming together, which is a beautiful thing. You see that Christ saves all people from different race, tribe, background, and tongue, creed. He brings them all together as his people. And now they're struggling with, what do I do in Jesus? And so you have some that will say, well, you got to come over here and keep the law. And so they would, they would pull people away and say, you got to come and, and keep the law because in the Old Testament, God said this. And they start making plausible arguments. Man, they sound good. Yeah, God is a holy God. God is a just God. God gave us these holy. God really establishes. Oh, like in Jesus, like we should all be keeping the dietary law, shouldn't we? Like, man, yeah, I, I was reading that and then I was reading the, what the Jews said about it and then in Jesus and then now, man, that sounds like a good argument. Man, I'm not doing that. It's God happy with me, <laughs> you know? And Paul says, you know, it sounds like a plausible argument. 
But don't, don't fall into that. Don't get pulled away from that. It may sound good, but it pulls you away. Or the philosophies of life, like just trying to answer those questions questions like what do you do how do you do it? and all those philosophies of life think about it like in the pagan culture philosophy was a big deal and they're trying to answer those questions and so they would say this is how you answer those questions and it was really uh interesting i, I didn't have it in my sermon but talking with andre afterwards he reminded me of paul at the areopagus where he's talking with the philosophers and what are they trying to do they're trying to answer those 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 big questions of life. And when Paul has something new that answers that question of life, they're like, we want to hear more about that. Tell us about that. And then when they hear it, they go, ah, no, I'm going to go with my philosophy. I'm going to go with how I answer those questions because that gospel, Jesus gospel thing where life, death, resurrection, that whole thing, like that sounds weird to me. I like my scheme better. And that means I get to live this way, that life looks this way and God looks this way. And so I like that philosophy. So I'll live over here. And so what happens in the church, Paul says, you have people that kind of pull back into that old way of living. They say, well, you know, like I had Jesus and, and faith in Jesus, but man, life just seemed to make sense to me before Jesus when I used to live like this when I used to behave this way, when I used to have this freedom, which really was keeping me in sin and binding me and pulling me away from Jesus. But man, it seemed to make sense to me. Life seemed to be easier when I did that. It seems really difficult now that it, I'm being changed. So we get pulled back into these philosophies or rules and regulations. This also goes back to the Jewish side, but it can also be on the pagan side. Like, what do you do? They had holidays on both sides. How's God pleased with me? How's God, how's God accepting me? Well, maybe I should do these traditions of the Jews, or maybe I should do these pagan traditions, but just do it with a Christian veneer. I'll just do it now, and I'll just make it, you know, Jesus-y. And God will be pleased with that, right? Like, I get to keep doing the same traditions and the same things, but, is, and, and God will be happy. Well, no, 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 that's not. These are, these are just rules and regulations that start pulling us away. What they do is they start saying, you have to keep these things, and the focus is now on those things, and not on God, not on Christ. And so now you're unsettled because, did I really do them well enough? Did I really do all the things that God wanted me to do in that? Or if I'm doing other traditions, or I'm adding traditions, it's like, is that really what God would have me do? Now, what I don't want you to hear me say is this, that, that family traditions and things are bad. Because we can have traditions and we can have things that we do that, that are just handed down from generation to generation, from, you know, parents to, to kids and, or from grandparents to parents to kids and all that. Yeah, you know, we see that and, and some of that's really good. There's nothing wrong with having traditions, right? But when you use those traditions to make yourself right with God, then they're pulling you away. Then they're missing the mark. Then they're, then they're doing something that they're not supposed to do. They're becoming rules and regulations, and they're like, what you do or don't do make you acceptable. And Paul says, don't get pulled into that. It will unsettle your soul. Or at the end here, what we see at the end of, of uh, this in, in 18, let no one disqualify you. And he starts talking about uh, the different things that were going on there. Uh, just this idea of self-denial and, and how you take care of the body or what you think about your body and, and visions and, and worship of angels and different things that were going on here. He says, you know, these areas uh, that are spiritual areas that people put forward can kind of unsettle your soul. I think about America. Anybody know what an old country buffet is? I said, in the first, okay, good. I said that the first one, I was like, is that only in the South? Like, did I use that? And people were like, no. I was like, okay, so Old Country Buffet, that's America today, I think. I think it is. It's like, we get our tray, and we put our Jesus by faith on it, and we start down the line. And we're like, oh, I like that one, and I like that one. And you just get down, and you're standing there, and you got this pile of whatever, you know, kind of heaped on there. And maybe for good measure, you just pour gravy over all of it, right? I don't know. But you're standing there, and you're getting ready to, you know, pay for it. Yeah, I'm doing the buffet thing. I'm not doing the one trip. I'm doing multiple trips or whatever. And you're looking at your plate, and you're looking back, and you're like, did I get the right things? Did I put the right spiritual things on my plate? Like, because that looked really good. Do I have room for that? Like, should I, 
you know, I, uh, that looks good over there too. And, and you start thinking, am I doing the right things? And, and this idea of just, did I have the right experiences and have I seen the right things and have I read the right things and have I prayed the right things? And this idea that all of that makes me acceptable, man, that's unsettling. And Paul says, it's not about the experiences that people will start coming with, like saying that you have to do these things and have these experiences to be right with God or to be walking with God. He says, those will unsettle the soul. These things are coming at us. So even in our culture, just as in Colossae, even in our culture, life is, is someone's messing with you. <laughs> it's like the kids in the back of the car, you know? It's like when the one's sitting there doing this and the other one's like, mom, he's touching me. And they're like, no, I'm not touching you. The world's doing that with you spiritually. It's doing it to me too. Like, and every once in a while they'll poke. And they'll, oh no, you moved your head. You moved your head. I didn't touch you. Right? It's happening. Someone's messing with us. Someone's messing with the church and it's unsettling. The person that's being messed with is always unsettled. They're like, I don't like this. I don't feel at peace. I don't like what's happening. But at the same time, I want to know that I'm doing all the right things. Right? Because in my scenario, God's in the front seat and he's going to turn around and be like, don't make me turn this life around. <laughs> you know? It's like, no, it was him. You know, like, but I want to do the right things. But I'm unsettled. And Paul says, you don't have to be unsettled. You don't have to let all of those things come and unsettle you. That, and that's the truth. That's what happens to us. So the, the problem, it goes back to verse 8, is that Jesus, this is not at the center. We've been taken captive by different things. So here we see that the mix is Judaism and paganism has kind of come in. I think a lot of us, uh, what we see in our culture today is more of this self-help teaching of spirituality. If it helps me feel better, it helps me seem closer to God, if it helps me, to, you know, we, if you go to Barnes & Noble and you look at the self-help section, it's a pretty big section. Self-help for everything. Well, I think you could probably combine half of the spiritual section along with it because it's just like spiritual self-help. You know, they just put it over with the religion section. And so here, I think this is what we really see that, that you know, Paul is saying, you don't have to worry about those things. And verse 23, we didn't read it, but this is what he says about them. Verse 23, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom. They look pretty good. They look smart. They look like they have wisdom behind them. But it, Christ is the fullness of wisdom. So they're not really giving us wisdom. They have this appearance of wisdom and promoting self-made religion and aestheticism and severity to the body. He says, but what? But they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. What is he saying? You can do all those things and this is unaffected. This right here doesn't change. All of those things will unsettle your soul and have you running after your tail trying to be right with God and your heart will not be changed. What it means is that you can have the appearance of change and not be changed at all. You can change your behavior, but you can't change your heart. And so what he's pointing to is he's saying Christ is the one that changes here. Christ is the one who changes our heart. Christ is the one who transforms us. These things unsettle us and, and, and capture us and keep us prisoner. But Christ sets us free and he changes the heart. And that's what we want changed. That's what needs to be changed. So people have this tendency of reverting back to their own ability, trying to strive after Christ and, and what they can do. And living this way, it drains a person. It steals their joy. I mean, think about it. Have you had conversations with a friend that where they said, yes, I accepted Jesus, and now I'm trying so hard to follow him, and, it's, and the conversation shifts to, and now I'm doing all of this in my own strength. Well, you just told me, like, here, you're, you're in faith doing this, and fought, walking in faith, and, and this was good. And now you're saying, but it's up to me to maintain it, and it's not. That's what Paul's saying. It's not up to you to maintain it. Christ changes you. Christ helps you through all of this. And so we don't have to go back to our old ways to make Jesus happy. And I'll show you why. This is the third thing. Christ is the one who settles us. So how does he do it? This passage shows the church how Christ moves them out of this area of trying to be fulfilled by other things or being made 
a prisoner to other things or held captive by other things and how Christ brings them into a place of wholeness and, and away from anxiety and into being settled and having peace. So uh, looking at, at uh, a few verses here in succession, starting in verse 9, he says this. For in him, that's Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Jesus is God. If you want to have peace with God, then have Christ. Because he's God. The whole fullness of deity dwells in him bodily. Fully God, fully man has come for us. And he says, come to me and I will give you rest. We want rest for our souls. You go to the one who can give you rest and that's Christ. Paul says, you want to be centered here. Those things don't give you peace. God himself does. And it's Christ. And that's in verse 9. Verse 10, he says this. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. And you have been filled. That's, that's a key thing right there. So it's by faith you come to Christ. And when we come to him by faith, he gives us his Holy Spirit. He puts his spirit in us. We are filled by him. So now the one who can bring us peace is now inside us, transforming us from the inside out, changing us. He is changing this heart of stone and giving us a heart of flesh. He is the one doing the work. And he's not doing it by adding all these other outside things. He's doing it from the inside. The Spirit of God starts transforming our lives and making us see him clearly so we can line up with him, so we can see he's good and have joy in following him and, and being in his presence. And so he fills us. So he, God, Christ, fills us, the believer. Verse 11, he says this. Got to find verse 11. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now this is an image that he's going back, he's using uh, language that's very familiar to the Jews and, and talking about circumcision. And they would say, you do this, you have this ritual of circumcision to be made right with God. And so it shows that you're part of God's family and that you are his. And so naturally, if you're going to come to faith in Christ, then you have to be circumcised. You have to, you have to come and have this done, right? You have to be like the Jews. You have to come to a Jewish Messiah in a Jewish way to find favor with him. And Paul says, no, no, no. He doesn't do it with hands. He circumcises our heart. And so what he's doing is he's using this image of circumcision, saying it's no longer in this physical way that they're trying to, to be connected back to God. He's saying what Christ has done is something spiritual and he does it for every man or every woman who comes to him by faith and he circumcises our hearts. And what does that mean? It means he cuts out the old sin, the old dead part of the heart that is dead in sin and he purifies our heart and he makes it healthy and holy and he, he cuts away. He circumcises that which makes us unholy and he transforms us. And so he circumcises our hearts on the inside. Verse 12, he goes on and says this. He uses another image. He says, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the, power, in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Now, this is, in theological terms, this is a way of describing and talking about union with Christ. And so this is what it means. You were buried with him when he died at the cross. When you came by faith to Christ, you weren't physically there, but spiritually, you died with him in that moment. You were joined with him at the cross. You were dead with him, buried with him. That's what the baptism metaphor is talking about. You were buried with him. He died and you died with him. You both have died. There was judgment to be paid and it was paid for at the cross and you died with him and you were raised with him. Meaning 
when he was resurrected, you spiritually were there in the resurrection with him. You were joined to him in the new life, in the new birth, in that resurrection that happened. You now are joined with him. So all of these ideas of trying to be made right with God were made right in that moment. That you died with him. You rose with him. You're made right now. There is no condemnation now. That's why Paul says that in Romans 8. He says, therefore, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because we're in him. We died at the cross. We were resurrected on the third day with him. By faith, spiritually, we were joined in Christ. We were put in Christ. And he says, so the only way that you and I can be condemned is if Jesus is condemned and he's already been condemned and he's paid for everything and he's been raised. And so you are set free. And so he makes this argument that it's not these other things that are going to give us right standing with God. It's being joined with God. It's in union with Christ. And he uses this illustration of baptism saying that you died with him and you were raised with him. Verse 13, there he goes on, he says, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. So those sins that, that we've committed in the past, those things that so easily entangle us today and the sins that we have yet to commit, all of those things were paid for at the cross. All of those things God has brought forgiveness to for at the cross, and that heart that was dead in sin, he circumcised it and made it new and alive, and in Christ we have newness of life, and there's no condemnation for us. Does that mean we get to live any way we want? No, we, we are being changed and transformed into the likeness of Christ. We walk after him. We walk in wholeness and purity and holiness. We're being transformed and changed, but that moment, all of the penalty that we owed was paid. Everything was taken care of. We have been joined with him. We brought from death to life by forgiveness. Verses 14 and 15, he says, and this is something we've talked about before. He says, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them over them in him. And what this means is, is it just like Jesus died and there's a whole bunch of notices nailed on a cross there, no, in a sense, what was nailed to the cross, that notice nailed to the cross was his body for us. And so we are set free. So church, we, we can be settled because Christ makes us whole. We don't have to look at the world and the philosophies and the different things and, and think this is the way to find wholeness of life. No, we can walk in newness of life in him. We're joined in Christ. He is the one who settles us and we have assurance that God is pleased with us because God's pleased with the son. Everything's done through the son and God is pleased with him and we are joined in the son and God is pleased with those who have come to him by faith. And he transforms us and changes our lives. And so we don't have to have anxiety and worry about the things of the, that others are saying, you do this to be right with God, or do that to be right with God, or walk this way, or talk this way, using that great theologian Aerosmith. Uh, you know, we don't have to do that. We can have peace. We can have peace in our life. And it's all centered on Jesus. We don't have to live with a lack of assurance hoping that we have the right rules, ate the right food, saw the right visions, worshiped the right angels. No longer do we live trying to assure ourselves, but in Christ we live in full assurance. assurance. And now we're ready to walk through life with Christ. And that takes us to chapter three for next week. So let me ask you this a couple questions. We're gonna, we're gonna pray, we're gonna sing, and we'll be done. But the first question is, have you been striving after spiritual wholeness by listening to the different voices of the world? And Christian, have you fallen back into some of those old ways, listening to the spiritual voices of the world that are just like, hey, this is where it is, this is where it is? Have you fallen back into those old ways of trying to make God happy by living certain ways? If, if you are struggling and you haven't come to wholeness in Christ, let me encourage you, receive Jesus. He will give you rest for your soul. He will give you wholeness. He will center you. And all those things that you've been entangled in and trying to do to make God happy, you can lay them down. 
you can let them go. Knowing that God's not going to be happy or sad. He'll be, he'll be happy that you let them down. But those aren't changing your standing before him. And Christian, if you've been entangled in those things, and when we sing, just ask the Spirit, hey, Spirit, show me where I've t- I keep falling into these patterns of living that aren't focused with Jesus in the center, and let me lay those things down. Because my soul seems troubled. I have anxiety and worry in my spiritual life. Help me have peace and wholeness in it. And lay those down. Repent of those things and ask God to show you where you need to lay those down. And then the other thing I would just say is, as we are getting ready to pray is, have you thanked God for just the union that you have in Christ? Just the wholeness you have, the freedom you have. As we sing, sing with him, sing with one another about just the joy that comes being joined with Jesus. Paul says, that's our foundation. That's the center of our focus. And all that other stuff, all those voices and all those things that clamor for your attention try to pull you away, we don't have to worry about it because we're focused on Christ. And when they come into view, we can put them aside because we recognize that they're counterfeit. They're not true. They're lies that have puffed themselves up against the truth of God. And we can say, nope, I'm not going to live that way. And I'm not going to let someone make me feel bad that I'm not living that way. Because I know God is pleased. And I'm going to live for Him. Let's pray. Thank you for listening. To find out more about the Bridge Bible Church or listen to previous podcasts, please visit thebridgewire.com. Thank you.